Welcome back to the Clara CFO Group channel. I am Hannah Smolinski, and today we're doing something a little bit different. So today I'm gonna to bring you guys an interview. We haven't done any interviews since we started with all the PPP videos, and um, but I had the opportunity to talk to this guy, and I just thought, hey, this is exactly who we need on the channel right now. So today I'm bringing on Jeff Grant. Jeff Grant is, you may have never heard of him before, I hadn't either, um, but you might have heard of him if you read Entrepreneur Magazine because he has authored one of their most popular articles this year. And it's all about how he went to prison for SBA fraud and the tips he learned from that and how we can apply them to this situation this year with COVID-19 relief. So, I'm super excited to talk to Jeff. He is a wealth of knowledge. He has done the small business thing, got an, an SBA loan, and is now kind of outside on the other side of some of his missteps along the way. So he's going to share some awesome information with us today, and he's going to tell his story. I'm not going to try to tell it for him in this intro. So Really, I just want to make sure that you guys are introduced to him and what he's doing, and so he can be a resource to you as well. Um, this, I never would have gotten connected with Jeff had I not been part of Upside Financial as their senior advisor for their PPP forgiveness service. So I'm super thankful to Upside Financial for connecting us because now I, I get to interview awesome people like Jeff. So um, thanks to Upside for that. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to delay this any longer. Jeff has a lot of good information. This is going to be kind of a long interview because we have a lot to talk about. But please, like, listen to the whole thing. He's got so much good information to talk about. And um, hopefully this will be super helpful to you as you're thinking about taking out SBA loans. All right. Let's go ahead and get into the interview. Jeff, thank you so much for coming on my channel today. Really excited to be talking to you. Thanks, Hannah. I'm really, really happy to be here. Awesome. Okay. Well, I, I did just, just tell everyone a little bit about you, but I thought it always comes, it, it's always better to just hear it straight from the source. So would you go ahead and just tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I went to prison for SBA loan fraud. And of course, that's not something that was really interesting to anybody for about 19 years. I, mean, I uh, I've traveled the country, written a lot of articles, um, spoken at conferences, talking about white collar crime and the cautionary tale and um, issues uh, that uh, white collar criminals and their families go through. But the particulars of, uh, of a um, SBA loan and why one would take one and why one's available and what might influence one to commit fraud in taking an SBA loan were not all that interesting because it was a unique phenomenon after uh, a disaster like 9-11, which is when I committed my fraud. And certainly there've been other loans after say uh, Superstorm Stan Sandy or uh, Hurricane Katrina, but nothing like we're going through now. So what happened was um, the uh, perfect storm of uh, COVID and economic decline happened and the government said that they were gonna release almost a trillion dollars of SBA loan money. And I kind of perked up and I said, well, wait a second, this, this is sounding exactly like what it sounded like at the end of 2001. And I wanna warn people that you could get caught up in this. So we wrote the article in, uh, in March, when I say wrote, um, um, it, it, you know, it, like any article, it, we really had to think about what the focus was going to be, and this was before anybody took the loans. Like, like this is a warning. Just and um, it it bit the article just took off, and um, as far as I know, it has over a million views now, which is crazy for this little article about someone going to prison for SBA loan fraud. And of course it led me to be introduced to you and the uh, team at Upside. Right. Well, 
I just appreciate you being able to tell your story because it's even somebody who's had something like this happen doesn't necessarily mean they want to talk about it. So I appreciate you taking the time and um, really just being vulnerable to talk about this. And I know it goes into what you're doing now. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what 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 you're doing now kind of on the other side? <laughs> yeah, I think that, I think on the other side is a really good way to put it because I did, I did spend 13 and a half months in prison for um, white collar crime. And when I came out, um, I volunteered for a little while and then decided that I wanted to go to seminary and become a reverend, mm -hmm. which was a big change of life from being a, a, uh, a New York Jewish lawyer to becoming a, a <laughs> white collar Catholic priest <laughs> in Connecticut. <laughs> and, 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 and I think the thing that I want to point out there, the reason I'm saying that is because a lot of people can get caught up in a lot of things, um, even if they don't intend it. I did intend it. I mean, there was no question I committed the crime. Mm -hmm. But after it, um, I tried to kill myself. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a very, uh, you know, it was the lowest of the low that you could get. And it wasn't like I popped up the next day and said, look, I have this great idea. I'll go, be, I'll go become a Catholic priest. Hmm. It, it took a decade or more of kind of slogging through, figuring out what life was going to be. And I went to seminary, uh, certainly searching on a, um, on a religious and a spiritual journey, but it was also a journey in which I knew I wanted to be of service to others. And I wanted to help people through so that they didn't have to be alone and frightened and go through all of these things in isolation. Um, it was just a theory at the time, because when I went through it, the internet was just kind of starting. Mm. And uh, that's how long it's been already. <laughs> and <laughs> I know it's crazy. And um, technology has really helped us because unlike say, if you go to an AA meeting, for example, if you go to an AA meeting, if, if you're an alcoholic, you go to a meeting, you go in your town and everyone's in the town. Mm -hmm. But people who've committed uh, white collar crimes are spread out all over the place. And it's only because of technology like Zoom, like we're on right now, mm -hmm. that we're able to reach them in these little isolated pockets and bring everybody into community. So that was a theory. Um, we, have, we started a white collar support group that meets on Monday evenings. This Monday evening will be our 240th meeting. Wow. So like we're way ahead of the curve mm -hmm. in terms of using uh, Zoom and before that some other platforms. But it's only since COVID that we've had like radical adoption by people. You know, we mm -hmm. didn't really know if people were gonna accept ministry just like you probably have with accounting or with law or anything else. Is this something that's going to be viable online? Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, we were doing it for quite a while. And mostly it was out of, ne out of necessity. And, um, and it's worked great. We've had over 250 uh, people join in our Monday night calls. And we've launched a, a couple of podcasts and and we reach out to people who are suffering in silence and in isolation. And we try to bring them not just good information uh, um, and also guest speakers like yourself, because you're going to be on our podcast pretty soon. Mm -hmm. But um, also we bring them into like a, a, a into back into community. You know, the, all these people mm -hmm. are ostracized and they're stigmatized and the world does not have a lot of compassion or empathy for people who've committed white collar crimes or their families. And uh, we, we, should, we give, give them love. And that's a, that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, I actually was just listening to one of your, I was listening to White Collar Week, which is the name of your podcast, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so I was listening to that more of your recent episodes and you had two other people who had also been convicted of crimes, had gone to prison, um, some white collar, some not. And it was interesting just hearing the camaraderie of, of you guys being able to like talk about what had happened and then also kind of the process of transformation, but, but also the mentality going into some of these kind of intentional, somewhat intentional actions. Um, and I kind of want to like ask some questions around that. Sure. I think right now we're seeing, we're, we're in a situation where people ha are, have the opportunity to take these PPP loans. They have opportunity to take EIDL loans and they're 
sometimes so some of them are having to basically go on the honor system. I mean, what we're doing is we're kind of going on the honor system for some of these loans. We're checking boxes on applications and we're doing these certifications. Um, but some people really truly do need this money and some people really truly don't and should not be taking the money. So <clears throat> what I wanted to ask you is kind of when you were going in and you took that loan from the SBA, what was going through your mind at that time? Well, it was raw desperation. Mm -hmm. There's no question. Um, at that point, I was losing my business. I had a very successful law firm back then. Mm -hmm. by, any de by anyone's definition, it was successful. But um, through, uh, at that point, almost 10 years of addiction to prescription opioids, I had really ravaged it and it was going down the tubes and there was no way to save it. But I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I um, after 9-11, my business continued to, to, um, excuse me, to decline, but there was no way to, um, to parse out what part of the decline was due to the drug use and what part was due to 9-11. Mm -hmm. um, so um, the, I would have done anything, anything for any grasp of, 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 of air, anything to try to, to try to save, save my business, but it, it was unsavable. And if I had come to you and I had said to you, you know, Hannah, you know, here, here's my workout. You would have told me fold the tent. There's like no way this can be saved. What an important thing to know before at that, I took an EIDL loan. So I had to take a uh, second mortgage on my house. I signed, mm -hmm. I, I signed the guarantee personally. My ex-wife signed the guarantee personally. Mm -hmm. And it was for $247,000, which is significant enough so that um, there were, I wouldn't have had that at that point, say in receivables to be able to cover right. it if I, if I needed to repay it. Mm -hmm. And um, although on my books, I had those that, that those receivables, actual collectible receivables were not, were not there. Got it. So I, I think that's a, a huge point because mm -hmm. these loans are designed to prop up people's businesses, to save businesses. Mm -hmm. um, so the first thing I did wrong was I tried to save a business that couldn't be saved. So I was left with the debt. It's not a PPP situation. Um, I was left with the debt. And then when my business collapsed, um, I had to sell my house. There was there were insufficient funds to be able to satisfy the loan in full, mm -hmm. and I defaulted. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that long thereafter. It was almost two years, but I didn't know I was being investigated. Uh -huh. I just got a I just got a phone call from uh, uh, two federal agents who told me there was a warrant out for my arrest. And I was in such denial that I had no idea that I was, that I'd even done anything wrong. That's interesting because you said that, um, I read your article, your entrepreneur article, and you also had an article in the Philadelphia Inquirer. Mm -hmm. And you had said that you knew that you, you, you intentionally applied and lied about where your business was physically located. Is that correct? Can you tell us about that type of loan? Yeah. Um, for that round of the idea loans, post 9 11 loans, you, you had to be located within the counties that were most affected by, um, by the 9 11 attacks. The county my office was in qualified. Uh -huh. So I didn't have to lie and tell them that I had an office uh, about a block from ground zero Do in Donald Trump's building at 40 Wall Street, by the way. Yeah. So <laughs> I didn't have to tell them that, but I was desperate and uh -huh. I, I, I would have said anything in order right. to get that loan. So when I, I got the phone call almost two years later that there was a warrant out for my arrest, um, I hadn't put the pieces together Mm. That that they had relied upon what I said in order to get approved for the loan. Um, I knew that I I I wasn't even sure what I had 
written down on the application because as you probably know, a lot of people don't know what they wrote on the applications. And, right. and, and the first question I would ask someone is, let's see your application. And, and then they look at us like, like we're crazy because they don't have copies of the, of the application. And I was in that situation. Um, I just didn't remember. And, um, and two years had gone by and in, in those two years I had tried to commit suicide. I went into rehab, I got sober. I was in the, in the midst of, a, of a, a starting a divorce situation. It was a lot of trauma. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, um, but as soon as they told me, I said, well, you know, I'll, let me get a lawyer and come down and turn myself in. Yeah. You know, I, there was no question in my mind as soon as mm. they brought it to my attention. Yeah. But um, it's certainly another one of my concerns is that people are just kind of wading in to things where you know, these are complicated business situations. You know, people don't have their books and records available and, um, and they're being asked to move very quickly. I don't, I don't mean to jump ahead in terms of topic here, mm -hmm. but, but that was true for me too. It wasn't like I, I did an exhaustive analysis of my business and was able to determine what I would use the money for and how I would apply it to saving my business. You know, the money was available and I got it. Uh, right. The second thing that happened was when I got the money, um, the first thing I did was pay off my personal credit cards that I had run up in the months prior, literally trying to save my business. Hmm. And so I was paying about 24% interest on the credit cards. Uh -huh. And the um, EIDL loan was about 3%, as I recall, in there somewhere. Right. And so it, it seemed to make sense, right? Replace the 24% money with 3% money. What I didn't know was that at, at the time was that I, uh, I had violated, uh, you know, a term and covenant of the, of the uh, small business loan. Mm -hmm. And um, um, well, I probably knew it. I just, I, I was, I was too intoxicated at the moment in, in both in getting the money and probably literally intoxicated. Mm -hmm. And um, I paid those loans off. Prob I played the credit cards off probably within a day uh -huh. of getting the money. And I mm -hmm. didn't know that that constituted money laundering. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, because I saw your charges, your federal charges, because um, they were federal, right? And yeah. Mm -hmm. Through the SBA, your federal yeah. charges were for wire fraud and money laundering. Well, the money, the money laundering was taking the loan proceeds and paying off my personal credit cards. Okay. Like that, honestly, that is huge because I guarantee you that there are a lot of people who got EIDL and PPP loans took the money straight home and either invested in something, bought a new car, bought, paid off credit cards, or like did a home improvement project or something like that, because they're saying, well, I'm the business owner. So like, it all kind of flows through to me anyway. Right. Right. So the, so you're saying that's money laundering. <laughs> the federal government sees that as money laundering. <laughs> I can't give legal advice any longer, right. but well, I can tell you in I'm, my case, it was money laundering. <laughs> I'm just going to make sure that that is clear for our listeners that like when, when I'm going through, I'm looking through these borrower certifications that we have to make on these loans. And when we're checking our box to say that we're going to use, we're going to use the money in the for eligible purposes, there's actually a little clause there that says the SBA, the SBA, if it's not used for eligible purposes, the SBA considers this fraud, basically. So I, I think it's just good to tie that together directly. This is what it looks like. So well, it's definitely a big takeaway here. There's yeah. no question. I think that what I'm seeing now, and I personally experienced was I owned a small business. There was really a, uh, a, a membrane between the business and my personal life that was very thin. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I took out of the business whatever I needed to, mm -hmm. to pay my bills. And sometimes that was, there was enough money to do that. And sometimes there wasn't. And um, since I was the boss and I didn't have a board of directors to respond to, that 
I, I pretty much did what I wanted. I think that um, one, I've learned that's not a good way to run a business. Living within your means is a very good idea in general. Yes. <laughs> and, um, and two, that um, understanding that the loan is designed to, um, is designed to um, save the business and not my lifestyle mm. is very important. And the problems of the day are real. You know, the problems of the day of paying a mortgage or paying a car payment. Um, and what I find with people who've been prosecuted for white collar crimes is that they're living in shame and they're living in um, secret lives for a lot of reasons. They're doing things that they're not proud of and they're not talking to their spouses. They're not talking to their friends about what's going on. So they don't really have the ability to think things through clearly. There's a lot of distorted thinking and a lot of distorted decision-making. Um, if any of us had gone to our spouses, for example, and said, listen, I'm thinking about taking a loan out and you're going to have to personally guarantee it. And the, the spouse would say, all right, what's the loan for? What are you going to use it for? Tell me all about it. But um, my, my, my ex-wife trusted me. Hmm. I, I, and, and she had no reason to distrust me. Mm -hmm. um, or at least no reason that I, I told her about to distrust me. Yeah. And um, so it made for a very messy situation. Mm -hmm. That trust thing is huge. I mean, that's, I mean, I, I think that's, that's the inherent, um, you know, thing with small businesses is they are so closely tied to personal um, that, you know, or we are seeing that, that like, I loved, I love the word membrane because that's kind of exactly what it is. There's just this little veil between personal and home life. So if the home life is, you know, kind of going bonkers or crazy or needing a lot of capital, then mm -hmm. the, the natural thing is for it to come from the business, um, because either it's very easy to make that happen or whatnot. Um, you know, I, I, it does seem to be a common theme though, that when things like this happen and people start to take those actions of maybe not being above board, the secrecy just continues, um, where, you know, had there been a place to talk about it, had there been a place to, or somebody to confide in, maybe they could have either been talked out of a situation or not gone as deep into something. Uh, because I imagine once you take a misstep like that, you probably have to take another misstep to cover it. <laughs> That's true. That's what I would think. So then it kind of gets like deeper and deeper. We're continuing to borrow. Like uh, we had been talking um, earlier in the week where you had mentioned that entrepreneurs tend to kind of get, they, they tend to think optimistically mm -hmm. that it's okay. I can borrow the money now, maybe use it for personal and then it's okay because I've got more money coming in down the road and I can replenish it and it'll be fine. And I don't have to worry about it X, you know, X, Y, Z. Cause we have that optimistic view that things will always get a little bit better right. or we've got great plans <laughs> to make more money, <laughs> whatever it might be. So I think that's, that's a really a good point to bring well, up here. I think I was like a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, I, I, pro I probably paid my 941s on time because um, I had about 20 in staff at the time. And so that that's probably larger than the, than the size of small business where people might roll their 941 money over. Mm -hmm. But um, I know a lot of people who just defer making payments or, and because they think that next year is going to be better than this year. And mm -hmm. especially in an up market, like we've had 10 years of economic recovery up until March of 2020. Mm -hmm. And people were just deferring obligations and thinking that every year is going to be better. And then along comes something like a pandemic and the sins of the past catch up in a hurry. Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to, borrow money to pay for the sins of the past instead of borrowing money for what it can be used for, which is to pay current operating expenses, then you can get into a jam in a hurry. Yeah. Um, 
another thing I want to point out here is that um, I've worked with hundreds of people who've been prosecuted for white collar crimes. Mm -hmm. And almost to a person, what they would say is that what they ha didn't have was the um, character to go into the bedroom and, uh, and approach their spouse and say, listen, mm -hmm. um, I'm about to do something wrong or I've done something wrong or my boss is asking me to do something wrong or it, it, this, I'm sliding over the line beyond the kind of ethics that, that I would like to have or that we had when we first got together. And they don't go to their spouse and talk to them because they're afraid their spouses would leave them mm. because m mostly it's males. M m m mostly it is males. And the males have become very narcissistic, egocentric, and um, in many ways they've they've left the marriage in a lot of ways. If they're not telling them the truth, then they're not good partners. Yeah. And and they're embarrassed and they're afraid that their wives will leave them if they don't have the money mm -hmm. any longer. And we've interviewed wives after, I'm just making this male, female, because it makes more sense for the illustration. Mm -hmm. And we've interviewed the wives after and almost to a one, the wives have said, I would have liked nothing better than to have my husband back, the guy I married 10 years ago. Right, yeah. You know, that, and she would have sold the house, she would have gotten rid of the cars, they were, she would have lived a simpler life. She just wanted her family back, mm -hmm. but he didn't believe that. Mm -hmm. And so he just kept perpetuating things, as you said, and things got worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there, there's that, that reckoning can be really like hard to, to, to confront, but probably once, once you do at the same time, I imagine the relief would be great as well. I mean, it might, it might not fix the problem, but I'm sure there's probably a lot of shame and guilt and, and just pressure. Like I, I think somebody on your podcast was just talking about how they couldn't sleep. Like they could, or always kind of picking up the phone and wondering if the little clicking on the other sound is, you know, them being listened to on their phone, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, that type of thing, like that type of anxiety that must kind of weigh over many people. I hear that that's, that's, common well it's like being on the run you know yeah. it's, i'm being on the lamb it's <laughs> it, you know it's it's frightening and it's exhausting mm -hmm. and um i know a lot of a lot of people once they've gotten caught it's the first good night's sleep that they can get i mean mm -hmm. other problems are, on, are are about to unfold but it's no more lying it's no more looking over your shoulder mm -hmm. and um one of the reasons I'm really op I'm I'm happy with the opportunity to be able to talk on your YouTube channel is that um, people ha I think people should know that there's another way of going about things, mm -hmm. um, and and it might feel more difficult because mm -hmm. it might feel like if things aren't going well uh, financially in business it might feel like you're you have to unravel your life or unravel your business? And the answer is, yeah, you probably do. Mm -hmm. But the alternative is not good. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that because you said, you know, that it could be difficult to explore other options. So, I mean, and, and I think, I think it's, I want to honor the entrepreneur and, understand that starting a business and growing it is a deeply personal process can be to a lot of people. And because also it seems so closely tied with almost who they are in some ways, yeah. the idea of closing a business can be, you know, if that's what the next choice is, you know, maybe take this loan and survive or take this loan and try to survive or potentially say, Hey, you know, this business, it's done. Like it's a hard place to come to, to, you know, come to that decision-making. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's deeply personal for a lot of people and it does take a certain amount of humility and, and just being able to look at it sort of objectively. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what advice do you have for people who might be finding themselves sort of at that place? I think that it's important to get real. 
I think that you have to know if you're at a pivot point or not. For, for most people, the pivot point was long before this set of circumstances even happened. Not necessarily. I mean, this is a huge one. What we're in now is, is huge. It's, 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 it's destroyed a lot of businesses and a lot of sectors. But for most people, uh, they weren't making the kind of business decisions that they probably should have or could have made along the way in terms of becoming more, uh, more um, cloud-based, becoming, um, you know, ca catching up with technology. Mm -hmm. um, and people are, a lot of people are lazy. Even if the businesses are, are kind of okay, they're not really making those critical decisions and they don't have enough um, outside voices coming in to help them. Mm -hmm. So now uh, a disaster comes along like the pandemic and the money's made available and wh what do you do? I think the right answer is to take a hard look at your business, maybe hire some professionals that can help you do that. If, and don't worry about the speed in which you have to apply for the money. Mm. Because if the money, well, one, we've already seen that the money's there, the money's still there. Even round one of PPP is back. So it's not the, that the availability of the money should be driving the decision. It's your need and what you're going to do with the money should be driving the decision. Mm -hmm. So an example of this um, is, uh, is the company Slack that I think just got sold for many billions of dollars. And Slack was a video game company. Mm -hmm. And they had spent a lot of money and had been pretty successful, but not very successful. And they realized that they were their, uh, at their cash burn rate, they were going to run out of uh, runway. They were going to run out of money. And there was no way that they were going to be able to monetize their, um, their investment in that video game. And so they had to make a decision. And uh, to their credit, they, they decided that, that one component, component of the video game, that's the communication piece between the players, might be more valuable than the game itself. And so they decided that they were going to pivot and put all of their attention into what we know as Slack now in terms of a communication tool. Mm -hmm. And it worked out, but it took a lot of, of, of business integrity and a lot of belief in themselves and understanding where they were in order to make that decision. Mm -hmm. Can you really make that decision right now with your business. Mm -hmm. If you're watching this podcast, is your business one that's prepared to pivot into the new world that we have that's, uh, that's still in the pandemic? Because if you can't see your way out of this within three months, six months, as long as this little, this little uh, hit of money is gonna last, you're just gonna find yourself in, this, in the same problem again, but potentially owing more money. Mm -hmm. So what's the plan? And I know for a fact, at least for the people who are calling me, that they're not only calling me to find out about the loans or what the repercussions could be of if you, if, you, uh, if you commit fraud or you wander into the problem, they're also telling me that they don't have a plan. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's square one. Right. If you get approved for the money, what is the, what's the use of it? How is it going to save your business? Mm -hmm. And um, I think that anybody who avoids that step because of the ease of getting the money is one is waiting farther into the problem than they are solving a problem. And three or six months from now, they're they're going to be sorry. Yeah, I I would agree. I mean, I I'm thinking back to you know March timeframe, and I so. Being a virtual CFO, I work one to one with clients, um, and so I had a couple clients that were in situations that they were kind of. We had just started together, and we were looking at the financial situation, and it was going, "Hey, let's see all the bad indicators of what's going on right now. First of all, you're already way in debt. Second of all, your personal expenses are taking everything out of the business. Third, um, you're doing an in-person service." 
that's going to basically be closed for we don't know how long, you know, and your business model was already kind of upside down and unsustainable. We were looking at all of these decisions and it was like, there were some that were very, very difficult to make. And I think it was very hard for the business owners to go and make the decision, but ultimately they decided instead of reaching out for funds, which they could have, we did talk about that as an option, they decided to close. And as, as hard as that was, it totally seemed like the right decision in hindsight too. I mean, it, it was hard in the moment, but in hindsight, absolutely the right decision. And also I still know these business owners and I can see the relief of like not running a business that was already struggling and they were, you know, feeling bogged down by. So like there's, even when you close a business, there's other opportunities that open up when you're not doing that, you have other opportunities to potentially go and do something, reinvent something and keep going. On the other flip side, I've had other clients who have totally taken something and run with it. I was watching one of your podcasts and you were talking about how much EIDL funds that you should borrow. And what you said was, borrow as little as you possibly can. This is a debt you're going to have to repay. And it's running at interest. So what's a prudent amount of cash that you should have in order to cover operating expenses? And I think what you said was two or three months maybe worth of cash, something like that. Mm -hmm. And it was really the first time it dawned on me that people could take less than all. <laughs> <laughs> right yeah I mean, the mentality is just get everything you can right but and, and and it's interesting because people were going out and they i mean the sva literally had a slider bar that you could oh yeah i saw that you know <laughs> there is no reason that i would possibly need to use that money and so it was kind of an interesting um operation and and then and then it gets the next step there's so many people who thought they were taking the eidl that it was forgivable so oh, now yeah. people have this money that they were spending on things and then they realize oh this is not forgivable money what were they doing with it and then a lot of people don't know what they were supposed to spend the eidl money on you know you know while, while we're talking about eidl for a moment mm -hmm. what I, I think is is really important for people to understand is that there are huge restrictions on your personal on your personal life and on your business spending when you take taking the idea loan essentially it's it, it's it's like having a watchdog watch over your life and mm -hmm. you can't be taking out more money you can't borrow more money you can't um your money is um is, is already secured by the, in the EIDL, so you can't secure uh, a, additional funding. Um, you need the SBA's permission to do a lot of things. Right. And that may not be the way you're used to running your business. So if you're willing to do that and you understand what those rules are, that's fine. But I get, my guess is that most people are not prepared for those kind of rules and that kind of scrutiny. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, and the EIDL, this last one, I don't know if the one that you took out was a 30 year loan, but this was a 30 year loan. Yeah. So, are you, I mean, uh, hopefully most people won't be paying it back over 30 years, but still it's, um, I think it's, it's like anything. They tell you how much your payments are going to be. And everybody's like, wow, only a hundred dollars a month. Oh yeah. For the next 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like, that's actually a lot. And then the, the fact that you don't have the same way that you would, if it was your, you know, self-funded or even bank funded loans um, and, and whatnot. So I, I do think that the SBA made it pretty hard to clarify exactly what the money could be used for. That was a big thing that um, when the EIDL first came out, I, there was, I was doing YouTube videos on it and a couple other CPAs were also trying to explain it, but even finding the guidance was difficult. Yeah. So, and that's CPAs going and searching for guidance. And then, you know, it wasn't really clear within the paperwork exactly what it should be used for and what it shouldn't be used for, you know? So so I think this is a great practice point. Mm -hmm. When anyone ever tells you that it's an interim final rule, <laughs> that means it's not a final rule. 
<laughs> and and it's almost scary. It is scary to think that you could actually borrow money, but the rules are not yet promulgated. The rules are to come in the future, and you have to be painfully aware of of where that's going. You have to stay pay strict attention. Now I know people who borrowed money, even PPP money. And as the rules changed, for most people, the rules got more relaxed. For most mm -hmm. people, the rules, but not for everybody. Mm -hmm. For some people, they, they didn't necessarily qualify. Or what happened was, in the interim, their businesses got better. Mm -hmm. And they didn't really need the money any longer. And they what they didn't want to have to do is is bear any kind of scrutiny. So I know people who paid back the money, even paid back the PPP money. Mm -hmm. um, for example, um, uh, Danny Myers at, uh, at, at Gramercy Tavern, they, they wound up, um, oh, not, not Gramercy Tavern, his, his uh, Shake Shack, they, oh, yeah. gave, they gave back the money. He mm -hmm. wound up borrowing money from his other company, but, mm -hmm. but Shake Shack gave back the money. And one of the reasons was because that, well, not only did he take some negative press because of it, oh, lots but, of but, but, but also they didn't under the, the rules hadn't been promulgated yet. They didn't yeah. understand what the rules were. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that that's kind of that, I think that was the negative piece of the PPP being so urgent. It was mm -hmm. that moment of, Hey, we put out this, we passed the CARES Act and then this is going to be available in like 10 days. It was, it was a very short amount of time, I think, from when it would, maybe it wasn't 10 days, but it was a very short amount of time from when the CARES Act happened to then when the PPP program was open. Right. And that, and then they said, oh yeah, and by the way, it's first come first serve. So it automatically, you're going to have everybody scrambling. And then automatically you're going to have people who have finance people on their side are going to be at the top of that list. You know, think about all the companies that have CFOs and they have whole accounting finance teams that can pull all this stuff together. Like they were at the top of the list of who's going to get this money, although it's supposed to be for small business, you know? <laughs> Listen, 3,000 so. 3, 3, Catholic churches wound up getting money in and um, how they did that that quickly, I have no idea. <laughs> But, but that was awfully fast. Yeah, I mean, I know actually churches have been hit really hard with mm -hmm. attendance being down. Sure. And, you know, I mean, tithing and giving has been, charitable giving has been probably at an all-time low because mm -hmm. of all of this. There is one point I want to make sure that I make here because it's, it's, it's 20 years later for me. This year is 20 years later. Oh, yeah. It's, it's 20 years po uh, post 9-11. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I want to kind of make a holistic spiritual point here. Okay. Since, since I'm a reverend, I get to do that. Yeah. <laughs> that um, I made mistakes. I paid for them. Mm -hmm. it, it cost me a lot of money. I, had a, I went to jail. But that doesn't mean that your life is over. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, there, everyone who goes to prison comes out of prison. Everyone finds a new, new life. Hopefully what you've done is... Um, found the silver lining in it, the good in it, been able to transform your life and, um, and follow a, a, a different path. Um, our ministry is around to help people do that, but there are other ways that you can do that as well. And um, I'm not motivated by the same things anymore that I used to be motivated by. When mm -hmm. I was a rough and tumble New York lawyer, it was win at all costs and make money and be in that be in that zone and some good things have come out of it and now i wouldn't recommend my path to anybody but if you're going down that path if it's too late for mm -hmm. example or or if uh, um if you happen to be convicted for a white collar crime um i'd like to be able to tell you that you can have life again and you can mm -hmm. have happiness and purpose and 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 you can have freedom but it, it takes a lot of work and uh, you can't do it alone. There's no way that um, the, the deck is stacked against you if you try to do it alone. So coming into a, a, a helpful, supportive community is uh, is very important, and that's what we offer to people. Yeah. Well, I I think what's you're you're doing is so interesting because like where has there been an opportunity to connect with other people who have done something that is so secretive? I mean, just the nature of this you know, a white collar crime would be very secretive. So 
um, I mean, I think it's great that you put a place that people can come to be able to find that first step or, you know, maybe they're, maybe they're on the other side already, but, um, yeah, I really like what you're doing, you know, going back to kind of the SBA and, and let's talk a little bit about just like the practicality of an audit and then, you know, being looked into when you first got your money, did you think that there was a risk of an audit? Did that ever come to your mind? No, no risk whatsoever. Never entered okay. my mind. I thought that, I thought that it was immediately after 9-11. And so it was a huge problem. And it wasn't, it was the nation's problem. It was, right. it was a huge problem. And that I was just this little guy who was never going to have to account for anything it was and and of course the problem we have now is hundreds of times the scale of that right and so and so i had the mentality as people do now that um that um it's way too large for them to ever focus on me right mm -hmm. and one i found out that's not true <laughs> <laughs> and two i don't know how I came to their attention. There's no, they don't tell you. So in my case, um, I had um, an active um, disbarment case going on at okay. the time. So there was evidence in relation to that disbarment case and someone who knew me well actually told the, um, the investigators that I had taken out an SBA loan. Mm -hmm. So the opportunity for the state investigators to have communicated with the SBA and, and flag my file was, was there. I'm, I'd be surprised if it didn't happen, but I didn't know about any of that at the time. Mm -hmm. When I sold my house and I couldn't pay off the loan in full. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was now in unsecured status. Mm -hmm. That could have been the flag that set it off mm -hmm. when my, my, when my payments were to begin, which now with, at least with an EIDL loan, now the payments don't start for a year, mm -hmm. but my payments never started because my business had collapsed. Uh, so I don't really know how anybody whose business collapses, how you can start repaying even, even a 30 year loan. Mm -hmm. So that could start the ball rolling. So I never, at none of those points did I really have any awareness that I could have come on their radar or that I would be subject to an audit, mm -hmm. but any of it could have happened. And then ultimately what happened was that I, they never did audit me because I got arrested. Mm -hmm. and at least in, at least in, um, in federal criminal, uh, um, criminal matters, by the time you're arrested, they've, their case is already solid. Mm -hmm. Okay. They're, they, 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 they're all, you're, you're indicted first or you're arrested first and they, they, they already have you. Mm. And, that, and that's what happened with me. Yeah. Yeah. Man, that's intense. So all this time you were having, having all these changes, your business closed, um, everything. And then, and then you get the phone call. Um, now when, what is the, what is the, um, let me see how I want to say this. Did you ever have an opportunity to defend yourself with what, with your spending, or did you just not feel the need to, cause you knew? That's a great question. Um, I had the opportunity to defend myself, mm -hmm. but it would have been to no avail. Uh -huh. It's a, the, the dynamics of what a uh, criminal litigation are, or a criminal prosecution and, and how to defend it and how to work with attorneys and what to do and how to do it, that it's really case specific. It's really particular to each person. But generally, just like in a business transaction, you work from the, the end result back. You, you have to, and here, um, I knew I had done something wrong, uh -huh. and what I was, what I want, and I what I wanted to do is I wanted to pay for my crime. Mm. I made I made full restitution. I, 
I knew I was, I was likely that I was going to have to serve time in jail. Mm -hmm. So I, I wasn't looking to, to get out of anything. I wasn't trying to wriggle my way out. Mm -hmm. I think that there are a lot of people who do, or at least investigate that and spend a lot of time and money trying to figure it out. But we're in a, a world right now of um, criminal prosecutions where over 95% of them are have plea bargains and there's virtually no trials mm -hmm. and uh, even fewer during COVID. And um, the government gives you a, uh, a disincentive to, um, to go to trial and defend yourself and an incentive to, uh, to resolve it quickly. Um, that's what I did. Um, mm -hmm. And I never looked back. Yeah. That's not, that's not true of everybody. But for me, I, I needed I needed to start living a right life. Okay, and you you had already kind of like sort of turned turned around, and you were kind of on your path to sort of reinventing yourself at that point. And you had gotten sober in in between that time, and you were kind of finding a new a new way. So this was kind of part of your part of your restitution in some ways. Was like, okay, I know what I've done. I need to go and serve the time. Is that yeah? It? Yeah, it, it was really a a restorative justice kind of yeah. concept. I had done the right, I, I did the right thing by the government. Mm -hmm. I was almost two years sober when I was arrested. I was almost four years sober when I went to prison. Mm -hmm. And that's not usual. I mean, mm -hmm. most people who are doing drugs or drinking, they're, they're doing drugs or drinking right up to the door of the prison. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you know, they're, you know, they're going through withdrawal in prison. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely would not not be a not be a good place to have that happen. I'm sure. No, no. no. <laughs> you came from it from understanding this from a lawyer's perspective too. You knew that there probably was not any any reason to try to go and try to defend yourself. But if let's say, let's say somebody walked into this and they ended up spending the money, maybe they didn't know they were taking it fraudulently. Mm -hmm. Is that any kind of, um, uh, what's, there's the legal term for this. Is that any type of remedy to the problem of, of ignorance? Is ignorance ever a good defense? Defense. Is it ever a good defense? Well, if you want to go into a technical definition, <laughs> technical conversation, in, in order to commit a crime, you have to have mens rea. That means criminal intent. That's right. So, so, so you, you you see all kinds of people running around when they first get arrested, saying, "I didn't have mens rea. I didn't have mens rea." As a practical matter, if you committed the crime, you're going to have to pay for it. It doesn't really. Um, I'm not a lawyer. I, I can't give yep. legal advice. Yep. Nope. No, no legal but, advice here. But, <laughs> but the mens rea defense, lack of mens rea defense, rarely is something you hear anyone really talking about that anybody can actually claim that and yeah. have it be some yeah. sort of belief yeah it, it, it could be a technical issue within a within a within a, a, a greater set of of, of defenses mm -hmm. um in my case for example I don't know if I had mens rea mm -hmm. you know I, I I could have gone in probably and said I was out of my mind on opiates mm-hmm but that's not a good defense. You know, it's, it, 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 I, I was misbehaving. I was doing things wrong. Right. And, and, and not getting help for that drug addiction was one of them. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't something that, that I could use, I could use to defend myself. Right. But I didn't know that in the beginning, you know, I didn't know, you know, the, like, and like everyone else you're trying to figure out how to get out of it. Right. That, for my case, that lasted for about, 30 seconds. Do you feel that more money can solve problems? Do you think throwing money at some of these situations is going to help us? Another great question. Um, I think that there's a, uh, a, a uh, ontological answer and there's like an existential answer, mm -hmm. right? The ontological answer is that the only things that are going to help us is, is, um, growth of character and becoming closer to God. 
Mm -hmm. right? All this focus on money and achievement and power is obviously having an adverse effect on a lot of things in our country. It's a very topical conversation that I'm not going to say more than that sentence or two. Mm -hmm. In terms of throwing money at problems, money usually exacerbates problems without a good plan. I mean, an example is that um, I was uh, running a, a work and learn program, an inner city work and learn program for a criminal justice nonprofit. This was about 10 years ago or so. And um, what we did was we trained people who were coming out of prison to do various jobs like uh, painting and small construction. And, uh, and then we had teams of people who went out to, uh, and we trained them and they went and they, they did the jobs and we were competing in the marketplace. But we were losing money on every job because our business, our business plan hadn't matured. Mm -hmm. So you had to be present enough to know that if you're losing money on every job, then more jobs means you're losing more money, right? It's pretty axiomatic, right? When you lay out the, right? When you lay out the PL, you can see you're, you're losing more money. So you have to be possessed enough to know that, that, in that particular case, we need to work on our model of where we're going to spend the money, the the, the grant money, and be able to get up, be, be able to get into into profit, not just sell more and lose more money. Mm -hmm. But of course, what happens is that at that point, the, the federal government gave us a million dollar earmark to go into this, this program. And I think we blew through it in 18 months. Yeah. And it was over. Yeah. I mean, that, that can happen in, in any type of, you know, I mean, how many, how many startups fail after they've received millions and millions, millions of dollars of venture capital funds, you know, how often does that happen? Um, I think uh, predicting the future is difficult. Obviously we can't predict the future, but we can make, we can make plans. We can make contingency plans. We can try to base, um, for our businesses, we can try to make decisions based on historical facts. One of the things you mentioned in your article in Entrepreneur is magical thinking. Um, and I think entrepreneurs sometimes fall prey to that. What is your definition of magical thinking? Magical thinking is, is over-optimism, thinking that everything is going to be okay despite the, despite the facts and circumstances that are before you, right in front mm -hmm. of you. And I'm still guilty of magical thinking. <laughs> I, I am. I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, th through and through. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I think that I was thrown into sobriety, uh, uh, business sobriety, um, because um, everything's not just going to magically be okay. It takes a lot of work and a lot of focus. You know, I, uh, I was the general counsel of this company. Mm -hmm. It was actually a precursor to open table. Oh. And, and, and we, we were, uh, it was just before the dot-com bubble burst. It was a dot-com bubble company. Okay. And, I and I was their general counsel. And we were in the midst of doing mergers and, and, the, the consolidation was starting. And so we were flying out to LA, a team of four of us were flying out to LA to, um, to look at a merger candidate. And literally we were gonna sit around the conference room table for three or four days until it either got done or not done, which mm -hmm. is a very efficient way of doing it, right? Mm -hmm. It's either gonna happen or it's not, yeah. but you're not gonna spend a lot of time. So, we, so the four of us flew out to LA from uh, from uh, uh, from uh, New York, and we flew out there, and they and we pulled up in front of the Fairmont, and they showed me to my room, and my room, my suite, was almost as big as my house, <laughs> and the first thing I said to myself is, "This company's not going to make it." Right. Yeah. 
because we should have been staying in a Red Roof Inn or a Motel 6 right. and been flying out on, on um, frequent flyer miles. Right. You know, mm-hmm. the fiscal the, conservatism. <laughs> and, and that was a, a great um, uh, lesson in magical thinking. Yeah. Because they thought the money was never going to run out. And then, of course, when March of, uh, of, uh, of uh, 2000 came, when the dot com bubble burst, February of 2000, mm-hmm. um, everyone went from this, this grandiose thinking. Uh, the whole market crashed. Right. And um, I'm not sure that's a good lesson in who survives that kind of thing or not. Mm-hmm. But I didn't think that that company had a chance because there wasn't fiscal conservatism. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Um, I mean, I just to kind of like wrap that idea up a little bit. Um, I think one of the best things small businesses can do is try, and I'm coming from this place of helping people with their finances, right, is, is trying to look forward and plan. And you, you mentioned it specifically with, you know, planning to take these loans. It's something that I preach as well. Um, I think it, it, it's a good lesson overall, like just because we have money doesn't necessarily mean that it means the business is going to last longer. It means how you use the money that you, that you have and how you're planning to use it is going to make a bigger impact overall. So, um, I mean, I, I want to remind people that I do have resources on my website for that. There's a cash flow forecasting worksheet that's super helpful specifically for that type of thing. So if you get this cash and you want to figure out how long it's going to help you going forward, because you're going to be spending, especially PPP, you're going to be spending it on payroll, rent, <laughs> and other like <laughs> allowable expenses. <laughs> um, I just want to like make sure that that's available to everybody. I mean, Jeff, this has been so helpful and just so fascinating. Thank you so much, first of all, just for sharing your story and being open to some of these questions that are a little raw. <laughs> the, um, well, I'm used to the questions. Yes. It's, 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 it's certainly part of, uh, of our ministry and how we help people. Our, our website is prisonist.org, prisonist like feminist. And um, our contact information is there. My email is jgrant at prisonist.org. And we have a lot of resources there, a lot of stories. Um, the entrepreneur article is there as well as a lot of other articles and, um, and specific resources for people and families who are going through white collar justice issues. Mm-hmm. Um, I would encourage anybody to go to the website, check it out, um, see what resonates and feel free to get in touch with me. Um, and uh, I, I take calls and um, emails all the time from people who are suffering or afraid. Mm-hmm. And uh, this w- one thing I, 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 I another thing I, I want to point out is that I get most of the people who reach out to me are either reaching out to me in the middle of the night because they're up because they're up at night freaking out, mm-hmm. and so they send a text or a, or or an email or a tw- or, or a, an instant message or something. And that's okay. Don't worry about. I'm, you're not going to wake me up. I have everything shut <laughs> off. <laughs> but I wake up to a ton of texts from people who are freaking out. Mm-hmm. And and the second uh, group of people who reach out to me more than any are are the spouses and family members, mm-hmm. because when you when you go through these things, you tend to freeze up. You know, it's flight. It's a freeze flight or fright or flight, whatever it is, fight or flight, but people, people get freeze up. Mm-hmm. And so I hear, you know, um, my husband or my wife is having this problem and that's okay. Mm-hmm. So uh, just reach out for help and we'll, we'll find resources for you. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Um, mm-hmm. And then also make sure um, you can see in the background there, white collar week is the name of his podcast. So mm-hmm. make sure you check out that too, whether or not you're experiencing your, you're living it or you're just interested in it. There are some really amazing stories there. Um, so lots of amazing, just amazing information. So Jeff, thank you so much. Really thank appreciate you, Hannah. it. Was a, it was a wonderful experience. Thank you. Thank you for talking with me. All right. Well, bye everyone. Okay. How awesome was that? Thank you so much, Jeff, for sharing just your experiences and being open and vulnerable to talking about exactly, you know, what happened and 
how you dealt with it and kind of where you are now. Thank you so much for being here. Guys, if anybody is interested in finding out more about Jeff, please, please check in the description box below. We're going to put all of his links there to make sure that you have access to him and his ministry if you're if you're looking for that type of support. And definitely also listen to his podcast because not only is it informative, but it's fascinating and really entertaining at the same time. So um, definitely look for his podcast, White Collar Week. And um, you guys, thank you for sticking through this. If you like this interview style and you want to see more people being interviewed, please put it in the comments below. Engage in the comments. Maybe Jeff will come in and answer some questions too. So um, you guys, just thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. You know, we bring this content out to you guys in a in a way to help inform and in a way to hope hopefully we are helping you guys, you know, not make mistakes. You know, we want to educate as much so that we can help you do it the right way and then try to avoid missteps along the way as well. So um, this is just another piece of information that we felt was really important to bring to you. All right. So please, you know, watch our videos to figure out how to do it right <laughs> and then reach out for support if you feel like maybe you've taken a wrong step along the way. All right. So thank you again for watching. Please subscribe to the channel if you're not already and have a great week. Bye everyone.